What was interesting about Voltaire's life? Voltaire, 1694-1778, led a very dramatic life. After his classical education at a Jesuit school, he chose literature over law. And his subsequent satires resulted in his banishment from Paris as well as exile to Holland. He spent almost a year imprisoned in the Bastille. All of this happened by the time he was 24. Voltaire was believed to be the best playwright in France for half a century. A disagreement with a chevalier resulted in another sojourn in the Bastille. After which he went to England and learned the language, philosophy, and politics of that country. In 1734 he had to flee Paris again, and for the next 15 years he studied physics. Metaphysics, and history with the highly intelligent Marquise du Châtelet, in Lorraine. During this time he was also at court. Protected by Madame de Pompadour, who was the mistress of King Louis XV. Voltaire became historiographer of France and a member of the French Academy in 1746. In 1750 he was appointed philosopher poet to Frederick the Great of Prussia, but they had disagreements after three years. Voltaire then bought a chateau in Geneva, Switzerland, and then an estate in France. In France he defended Jean Collas, a Protestant who in 1762 was tortured on the rack and executed. Voltaire was by then very rich and he devoted himself to causes against the oppression of the church. When he returned to Paris at age 83, he was highly acclaimed, but died soon afterwards. He was first buried outside Paris, but then his remains were moved to the Pantheon. Only to be again disinterred during the Restoration. Voltaire's body was never completely reassembled after that. What was interesting about Voltaire's life? Voltaire, 1694-1778, led a very dramatic life. After his classical education at a Jesuit school, he chose literature over law. And his subsequent satires resulted in his banishment from Paris as well as exile to Holland. He spent almost a year imprisoned in the Bastille. All of this happened by the time he was 24. Voltaire was believed to be the best playwright in France for half a century. A disagreement with a chevalier resulted in another sojourn in the Bastille. After which he went to England and learned the language, philosophy, and politics of that country. In 1734 he had to flee Paris again, and for the next 15 years he studied physics. Metaphysics, and history with the highly intelligent Marquise du Châtelet, in Lorraine. During this time he was also at court. Protected by Madame de Pompadour, who was the mistress of King Louis XV. Voltaire became historiographer of France and a member of the French Academy in 1746. In 1750 he was appointed philosopher poet to Frederick the Great of Prussia, but they had disagreements after three years. 
Voltaire then bought a chateau in Geneva, Switzerland, and then an estate in France. In France he defended Jean Collas, a Protestant who in 1762 was tortured on the rack and executed. Voltaire was by then very rich and he devoted himself to causes against the oppression of the church. When he returned to Paris at age 83, he was highly acclaimed, but died soon afterwards. He was first buried outside Paris, but then his remains were moved to the Pantheon. Only to be again disinterred during the Restoration. Voltaire's body was never completely reassembled after that. What were Voltaire's main contributions to philosophy? In his letters concerning the English nation, 1734, published as part of his philosophical letters. Voltaire introduced a French audience to the ideas of John Locke, 1632-1704, and Isaac Newton, 1643-1727. At the same time, he offered political criticism of the ancient regime which was to motivate the French Revolution. Against Blaise Pascal, 1623 to 1662, who in the previous century had counseled quietism and claimed that suffering on earth was excellent preparation for heaven. Voltaire argued for the betterment of human life in the here and now. Voltaire's letter on Mr. Locke in his Philosophical Dictionary took up a possibility raised by Locke of matter being able to think. However, later in life, he retreated to a skeptical position on such materialism after it was taken up by the philosophes in defense of atheism. What were Voltaire's main contributions to philosophy? In his letters concerning the English nation, 1734, published as part of his philosophical letters, Voltaire introduced a French audience to the ideas of John Locke, 1632-1704, and Isaac Newton, 1643-1727. At the same time, he offered political criticism of the ancient regime, which was to motivate the French Revolution. Against Blaise Pascal, 1623-1662, who in the previous century had counseled quietism and claimed that suffering on earth was excellent preparation for heaven. Voltaire argued for the betterment of human life in the here and now. Voltaire's letter on Mr. Locke in his philosophical dictionary took up a possibility raised by Locke of matter being able to think. However, later in life, he retreated to a skeptical position on such materialism after it was taken up by the philosophes in defense of atheism. What were Voltaire's religious views? Voltaire rejected the wager of the brilliant 17th century mathematician Blaise Pascal, 1623 to 1662. 
The following passage from Pascal's Ponces constitutes the famous wager, God is, or he is not. But to which side shall we incline? Reason can decide. Nothing here. There is an infinite chaos which separated us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn. Up. Which will you choose then? Let us see. Since you must choose. Let us see which interests you least. You have two things to lose, the true and the good, and two things to stake, your reason and your will. Your knowledge and your happiness, and your nature has two things to shun, error and misery. Your reason is no more shocked in choosing one rather than the other. Since you must of necessity choose. But your happiness. Let us weigh the gain and the loss in. Wagering that God is. If you gain, you gain all, if you lose, you lose nothing. Wager, then, without hesitation that he is. In other words, if we don't know whether God exists, we have two choices. We can base our life on the premise that he is. In that case, if he exists, we will go to heaven. But suppose he doesn't exist? It's still better to bet that he is, because if he isn't, we lose nothing. Whereas, if we bet that he isn't and he isn't, we are merely confirmed in our misery, but if he turns out to exist, we go to hell when we die. Voltaire would have none of this. Voltaire believed that the design evident in nature was proof of God's existence, as first cause, prime mover, and supreme intelligence. How can a benevolent and omnipotent God permit evil to exist? Voltaire was very distressed by the Lisbon earthquake and tidal wave that struck on All Saints Day in 1755, killing thousands. In his poem Sir L.E. Disaster to Lisbon, 1755, he rejected both Leibnizian optimism and the doctrine of original sin. He concluded that all humans can do is accept such evil and continue to worship. In Tzadig and other writings his sense of religious awe was further stressed. He maintained an attitude of tolerance for the rest of his life, with ongoing interests in the teachings of Confucius and the Quakers. In his final years, Voltaire overtly attacked the Catholic Church for its intolerance. He proclaimed, those who can make you believe absurdities, can make you commit atrocities. What were Voltaire's religious views? Voltaire rejected the wager of the brilliant 17th century mathematician Blaise Pascal, 1623-1662. The following passage from Pascal's Ponces constitutes the famous wager, God is, or he is not. But to which side shall we incline? Reason can decide. Nothing here. There is an infinite chaos which separated us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn. Up. Which will you choose then? Let us see. Since you must choose. Let us see which interests you least. You have two things to lose, the true and the good, 
and two things to stake, your reason and your will. Your knowledge and your happiness, and your nature has two things to shun, error and misery. Your reason is no more shocked in choosing one rather than the other. Since you must of necessity choose. But your happiness. Let us weigh the gain and the loss in. Wagering that God is. If you gain, you gain all, if you lose, you lose nothing. Wager, then, without hesitation that he is. In other words, if we don't know whether God exists, we have two choices. We can base our life on the premise that he is. In that case, if he exists, we will go to heaven. But suppose he doesn't exist? It's still better to bet that he is, because if he isn't, we lose nothing. Whereas, if we bet that he isn't and he isn't, we are merely confirmed in our misery, but if he turns out to exist, we go to hell when we die. Voltaire would have none of this. Voltaire believed that the design evident in nature was proof of God's existence, as first cause, prime mover, and supreme intelligence. How can a benevolent and omnipotent God permit evil to exist? Voltaire was very distressed by the Lisbon earthquake and tidal wave that struck on All Saints Day in 1755, killing thousands. In his poem Sir L.E. Disaster to Lisbon, 1755, he rejected both Leibnizian optimism and the doctrine of original sin. He concluded that all humans can do is accept such evil and continue to worship. In Tzadig and other writings his sense of religious awe was further stressed. He maintained an attitude of tolerance for the rest of his life, with ongoing interests in the teachings of Confucius and the Quakers. In his final years, Voltaire overtly attacked the Catholic Church for its intolerance. He proclaimed, those who can make you believe absurdities, can make you commit atrocities. Who was Jonathan Edwards? Jonathan Edwards, 1703-1758, was the third president of Princeton University. Although he died a year after he was elected. Who was Jonathan Edwards? Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758, was the third president of Princeton University. Although he died a year after he was elected. He was educated at Yale, preached and knew how did the Enlightenment affect the United States? America did not develop its own philosophical tradition until the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the period before the American Revolution and the founding of the New Republic, the excitement of liberty from oppressive government, the dignity of the individual, and rights to private property were all highly motivating ideas. 
these optimistic ideas were inspirational in the writings of Thomas Paine. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and others The American separation of church from state, as an article of individual liberty against oppressive government religion. And for free thought and speech came directly from Enlightenment ideas. As did the division of the powers of government and the distrust of government. It should be noted, however, that libertinism and outright atheism were to remain European phenomena for a very long time. Under the inspiration of Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758, American Protestant religious philosophy flourished. In the late 18th century in a New England born-again movement known as the Great Awakening. York City, and became a leader of the Great Awakening in 1729 in Massachusetts. His theology was a Puritan form of Calvinism. Edward's interest in philosophy included Nicholas Malebranche. 1638 to 1715, the Cambridge Platonists, and John Locke, 1632 to 1704. He was himself an idealist, similar to George Berkeley, 1685 to 1783, who held that human minds are made up of thoughts and sensations, God being the only true substance. He was educated at Yale, preached and knew how did the Enlightenment affect the United States? America did not develop its own philosophical tradition. Until the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the period before the American Revolution and the founding of the New Republic, the excitement of liberty from oppressive government, the dignity of the individual, and rights to private property were all highly motivating ideas. These optimistic ideas were inspirational in the writings of Thomas Paine. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and others. The American separation of church from state, as an article of individual liberty against oppressive government religion. And for free thought and speech came directly from Enlightenment ideas. As did the division of the powers of government and the distrust of government. It should be noted, However, that libertinism and outright atheism were to remain European phenomena for a very long time. Under the inspiration of Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758, American Protestant religious philosophy flourished. In the late 18th century in a New England born-again movement known as the Great Awakening. York City, and became a leader of the Great Awakening in 1729 in Massachusetts. His theology was a Puritan form of Calvinism. Edward's interest in philosophy included Nicholas Malebranche. 1638 to 1715, the Cambridge Platonists, and John Locke, 1632 to 1704. He was himself an idealist, similar to George Berkeley, 1685 to 1783, who held that human minds are made up of thoughts and sensations, God being the only true substance. What was original in Jonathan Edwards' view of God?
Jonathan Edwards developed the idea that God loves and is delighted by himself and creates us and other creatures as part of this joy in himself. Edwards taught that God's love is disinterested and that he is supremely beautiful. Infusing the entire world with his loveliness. By comparison, the beauty seen by mortals is secondary, an imperfect copy of what God sees. What was original in Jonathan Edwards' view of God? Jonathan Edwards developed the idea that God loves and is delighted by himself and creates us and other creatures as part of this joy in himself. Edwards taught that God's love is disinterested and that he is supremely beautiful. Infusing the entire world with his loveliness. By comparison, the beauty seen by mortals is secondary, an imperfect copy of what God sees. Was Jonathan Edwards merciful toward sinners? Not in the least. Jonathan Edwards thought that many humans were depraved and that a real hell awaited them. There is a tone of delight in these facts in his 1741 sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards not only believed that sinners would be punished, but that God himself had no pity for their agony. He wrote, If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case, or showing you the least regard or favor, that instead of that, he will only tread you underfoot. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you. Yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy, he will crush out your blood. And make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments, so as to stain all his raiment. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. And, insofar as the virtuous strive to emulate God, Edwards felt it is fitting that they enjoy the suffering of such sinners in hell. In 1758, in his Why Saints in Glory Will Rejoice to See the Torments of the Damned, Edwards wrote, when they shall see how miserable others of their fellow creatures are, who were naturally in the same circumstances with themselves. When they shall see the smoke of their torment, and the raging of the flames of their burning, and hear their dolorous shrieks and cries, and consider that they in the meantime are in the most blissful state, and shall surely be in it to all eternity, how will they rejoice? Was Jonathan Edwards merciful toward sinners? Not in the least. Jonathan Edwards thought that many humans were depraved and that a real hell awaited them. There is a tone of delight in these facts in his 1741 sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards not only believed that sinners would be punished, but that God himself had no pity for their agony. 
he wrote, if you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case. Or showing you the least regard or favor, that instead of that, he will only tread you underfoot. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you. Yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy, he will crush out your blood. And make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments, so as to stain all his raiment. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. And, insofar as the virtuous strive to emulate God, Edwards felt it is fitting that they enjoy the suffering of such sinners in hell. In 1758, in his Why Saints in Glory Will Rejoice to See the Torments of the Damned, Edwards wrote. When they shall see how miserable others of their fellow creatures are, who were naturally in the same circumstances with themselves. When they shall see the smoke of their torment and the raging of the flames of their burning, and hear their dolorous shrieks and cries. And consider that they in the meantime are in the most blissful state, and shall surely be in it to all eternity, how will they rejoice? Which counter-enlightenment figures had lasting effects on philosophy? Giovanni Battista, Guillaume Battista, Vico, or Vigo, 1668-1744 Has in recent years been rediscovered, or discovered, as an important philosopher. Edmund Burke, 1729-1797, was the most explicit conservative of modern times. Although Joseph Marie de Maister, 1753-1821, held similar views. Also, Jonathan Swift, 1667-1745, deserves mention as a mordant critic of the establishment in general and the Marquis de Sada, 1740-1814, represents a kind of extreme marginality in his depravity. Which marginality was later taken up by 19th and 20th century progressives he also remains genuinely outrageous. Which counter-enlightenment figures had lasting effects on philosophy? Giovanni Battista, Guillaume Battista, Vico, or Vigo, 1668-1744 Has in recent years been rediscovered, or discovered, as an important philosopher. Edmund Burke, 1729-1797, was the most explicit conservative of modern times. Although Joseph Marie de Maister, 1753-1821, held similar views. Also, Jonathan Swift, 1667-1745, deserves mention as a mordant critic of the establishment in general and the Marquis de Sada, 1740-1814, represents a kind of extreme marginality in his depravity. Which marginality was later taken up by 19th and 20th century progressives he also remains genuinely outrageous.
What is occasionalism? Occasionalism is the theory that nothing in real life ever caused anything else. God determined everything that each thing would do when he created the world. So, when one pool ball hits another and the second moves, the first pool ball does not cause the second to move because the second ball was already programmed to move that way on its own. Occasionalism holds that everything that seems to interact is like two clocks side by side with one a fraction of a second set ahead of the other. When the faster clock's handles move, it only looks like it's causing the slower clock's handles to move. Were all 18th century thinkers in agreement with Enlightenment themes? No. As a counter tradition to the general rational spirit of the Enlightenment were the Romantics. Such as the writers Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Johann Gottfried Herder, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, Friedrich Schiller, and William Wordsworth. There were also those, generally referred to as the pessimists of the Enlightenment, who did not subscribe to the belief in progress characteristic of the age. For example, in philosophy, Guy Ambatis de Vico, Edmund Burke, and Joseph Marie de Maistre. And in letters, William Cooper, Coderlos de Laxlos, the Marquis de Sada, and Jonathan Swift. What was interesting about Voltaire's life? Voltaire 1694 to 1778, led a very dramatic life. After his classical education at a Jesuit school, he chose literature over law. And his subsequent satires resulted in his banishment from Paris as well as exile to Holland. He spent almost a year imprisoned in the Bastille. All of this happened by the time he was 24. Voltaire was believed to be the best playwright in France for half a century. A disagreement with the Chevalier resulted in another sojourn in the Bastille. After which he went to England and learned the language, philosophy, and politics of that country. In 1734 he had to flee Paris again, and for the next 15 years he studied physics, metaphysics, and history with the highly intelligent Marquise du Châtelet, in Lorraine. During this time he was also at court. Protected by Madame de Pompadour, who was the mistress of King Louis XV. Voltaire became historiographer of France and a member of the French Academy in 1746. In 1750 he was appointed philosopher-poet to Frederick the Great of Prussia, but they had disagreements after three years. Voltaire then bought a chateau in Geneva, Switzerland, and then an estate in France. In France he defended Jean Collas, a Protestant who in 1762 was tortured on the rack and executed. Voltaire was by then very rich and he devoted himself to causes against the oppression of the church. When he returned to Paris at age 83, 
he was highly acclaimed, but died soon afterwards. He was first buried outside Paris, but then his remains were moved to the Pantheon. Only to be again disinterred during the Restoration. Voltaire's body was never completely reassembled after that. Which counter-enlightenment figures had lasting effects on philosophy? Giovanni Battista, Giambattista, Vico, or Vigo, 1668-1744 has in recent years been rediscovered, or discovered, as an important philosopher. Edmund Burke, 1729-1797, was the most explicit conservative of modern times. Although Joseph Marie de Maister, 1753-1821, held similar views. Also, Jonathan Swift, 1667-1745, deserves mention as a mordant critic of the establishment in general. And the Marquis de Sada, 1740-1814, represents a kind of extreme marginality in his depravity. Which marginality was later taken up by 19th and 20th century progressives he also remains genuinely outrageous. What is known about Immanuel Kant's life? Immanuel Kant was born in Königsberg in East Prussia. His father was a saddler, and his grandfather was a Scottish immigrant. After attending the local high school, he was taught by the philosopher Marin Knudsen at the University of Königsberg. He worked as a tutor and returned to take a master's degree, after which he was employed as a privat docent. Private docent, or PD, to teach physics, mathematics, anthropology, geography, and some philosophy. In his courses on anthropology and geology. He taught the prevailing view of European racial supremacy over Asians and Africans. He was poor until 1770, when he secured the position of Chair of Logic and Metaphysics at Königsberg. Other European intellectuals, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712-1778, whom Kant greatly admired constantly moved and traveled to secure their fame and livings, with amorous and political adventure. As a kind of byproduct of their intellectual careers. But that was not for Kant. He never left the area of East Prussia. And remained a bachelor in Königsberg, now Kaliningrad, all his life. When the Prussian king asked him not to publish further about religion in 1794, he duly complied. Kant's health was fragile, but he took care of himself, living until he was 80. He relied on travelers and published works for information about the outside world and was content to dine with friends and fulfill his professorial duties including a term as rector of the university. Kant's early works were about natural science. The most notable being his general history of nature and theory of the heavens, 1755. His magnum opus was the critique of pure reason. But when it finally appeared in 1781 few could understand it. 
he tried to make his ideas more accessible in his prolegomena to every future metaphysics, 1783. This was followed by his 1790 Critique of Practical Reason and the Critique of Judgment. In 1793 and 1797, he published Religion Within the Bounds of Mere Reason and the Metaphysic of Morals. Kant was by then famous, but younger thinkers undertook to explain his system better than he had. He was working on his response to them in his opus posthumum when he died. Who was Gotthold Lessing? Gotthold Lessing, 1729-1781, represented the philosophes in Germany. Which was a difficult task, owing to the conservatism and strict censorship there. In Nathan the Wise, 1779, he argued for the toleration of Jews and for human equality across religions. In On the Education of the Human Race, 1780, he claimed that all religions are part of a progression of humanity to the point when it will turn away from religion and toward pure reason. What was Immanuel Kant's theory of the self? Kant distinguished between the empirical ego and the transcendental ego. The empirical ego is what we normally think of as the self and are able to experience. The transcendental ego is the necessary origin of those fundamental structures of thought and intuition that are necessary for experience. The transcendental ego is known only as an object of thought, and not as an object of direct experience. Kant's motivating metaphysical question was How is it possible to know certain principles about the world, without prior experience? Kant's solution was to apply a transcendental deduction to such principles and show that without them experience would not be possible. For example, concerning causation, he argued that consciousness itself requires orderly experience based on necessary connections in reality. This was Kant's answer to David Hume's, 1711-1776, reduction of causation to constant conjunction. He rejected Hume's skepticism that constant conjunction is all that there is by claiming that the world could only make sense to us if we assumed that, that there were real causal connections in it. In his prolegomena to every future metaphysics, 1783. Kant famously said that Hume had awakened him from his dogmatic slumbers. Is Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative different from the Golden Rule? Yes, it is. According to the Golden Rule, we should act as we would have others act toward us. If our tastes are perverted or we do not care for our own welfare, 
The golden rule could permit acts of depravity and violence, but such acts could never be willed categorically. Moreover, Kant's system is strongly based on individual good. Will toward the community of all other rational individuals. There is a debt to Jean Jacques Rousseau's, 1712-1778, idea of the common good here. Indeed, Kant greatly respected Rousseau's moral philosophy. What was George Berkeley's new theory of vision? Berkeley, like René Descartes, 1596 to 1650, sought to account for the perception of distance. Descartes had claimed in his Dioptrix, 1647, that an innate knowledge of geometry enables even those who have never studied geometry to calculate distance by figuring. Out the height of a triangle formed by light rays from the visible object to each eye. Berkeley built on Irish natural philosopher William Molyneux's 1656 to 1698 claim that distance as a length from the object to the eye cannot itself be seen. Berkeley reasoned that since what is seen is a two-dimensional object. Its relation to distance is contingent, dependent on sensations in the eyes and associations in the mind between what has been touched and what is seen. These associations depend on past experience. The overall result of Berkeley's reasoning about how vision works is that visual perception is an active, learned process. He also claimed, against John Locke, 1632-1704, that there are no general ideas common to both sight and touch. What was Immanuel Kant's Copernican revolution? Just as Copernicus changed the center of our universe from Earth to Sun, Kant relocated the basic principles and categories of reality, as studied by science, from the external world to the mind. Like John Locke, 1632-1704, he began with an examination of the powers of the mind and an aim to reject metaphysical claims that could not be rationally justified. He posited a human rational necessity to understand real experience in space and time and a practical need to live with other rational beings, seeking the principles that could fulfill those requirements. In 1770 Kant argued in on the form and principles of the sensible and intelligible world that our knowledge of space and time is only about appearances, but that we are still justified in making limited claims about what lies behind those appearances. This was the foundation for what became known as critical philosophy. Kant's revolutionary claim was that we have a priori knowledge of both space and time. Because they are the forms of our perception, space is the organization of experience in the outer world. While time is the organization of experience in the inner world. This was followed by the two editions of his critique of pure reason. With his prolegomena to any future metaphysics published in between to respond to criticism.
What was Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative? Kant is usually interpreted to have two formulations. First, act so that the maxim of your action, or the generalization describing it, can be willed by you to be a general rule, to be followed by all rational agents. In other words, only do those things that you as a benevolent, rational being can will that everyone do. The test of a categorical imperative is what happens if everyone follows it. Something that has good consequences in a particular case might not have good consequences in all cases. For example, if the maxim is obey traffic rules, and you come to a red light with no other cars in attendance. You may not drive through it, even though the consequences in this particular case would be benign. Or, to use an example of Kant's, if the maxim is not to lie, and a madman is looking for a friend. Of yours whose whereabouts you know, you may not lie in this case. Because overall you can't benevolently will that everyone be permitted to lie whenever the consequences are good for them. To take another example of Kant's, you may not take your own life. No matter how miserable you are, because you categorically can't will suicide as a good action. What was Immanuel Kant's moral system? Kant's moral starting point is the distinction between things that are instrumentally or hypothetically good because they have good consequences, and things that are good in and of themselves. The only thing that is good in itself is a good will or benevolence, without which every other gift of fortune can be just cause for resentment. Morality is for rational beings, and rational beings require principles of action. In the community of rational beings, or the kingdom of ends. Actions are good if they are autonomous, which is to say freely chosen. According to Kant, a rational being is autonomous or self-ruling. The rules that a rational being uses to regulate himself are absolute what Kant called categorical. Such rules are imperatives and are followed for their own sake. Hypothetical rules, by contrast, are followed in order to make something else happen. For example, do not harm innocent people would be a categorical. Rule and eat your vegetables would be a hypothetical rule. Was Immanuel Kant a recluse? Yes. He lived a very precise and orderly life. And his neighbors claimed to be able to set their clocks by his daily walks. During the 1770s, he retreated into what biographers call his silent decade. He set himself the task of figuring out how perception and intellect are connected. Never a bone vivant, he withdrew from even minimal social contact. But he was very forthright about what was going on in his life and did not make the usual social excuses. When a former student tried to coax him out, he responded in this manner. 
Any change makes me apprehensive, even if it offers the greatest promise of improving my condition. And I am persuaded by this natural instinct of mine that I must take heed if I wish that. The threads which the fates spin so thin and weak in my case to be spun to any length. My great thanks, to my well-wishers and friends, who think so kindly of me as to undertake my welfare. But at the same time a most humble request to protect me in my current condition from any disturbance. What were Voltaire's main contributions to philosophy? In his letters concerning the English nation, 1734, published as part of his philosophical letters. Voltaire introduced a French audience to the ideas of John Locke, 1632 to 1704 and Isaac Newton 1643 to 1727 At the same time he offered political criticism of the ancient regime which was to motivate the French Revolution Against Blaise Pascal 1623 to 1662 who in the previous century had counseled quietism and claimed that suffering on earth was excellent preparation for heaven. Voltaire argued for the betterment of human life in the here and now. Voltaire's letter on Mr. Locke in his philosophical dictionary took up a possibility raised by Locke of matter being able to think. However, later in life, he retreated to a skeptical position on such materialism after it was taken up by the philosophes in defense of atheism. What was Immanuel Kant's second formulation of the categorical imperative? According to Kant, all rational beings are intrinsically valuable. And in the kingdom of ends, no one is a means to the end of anyone else. In the world of affairs what we do and who we are have prices. But in the kingdom of ends there are no prices, only dignities. The second formulation of the categorical imperative is that one must always act to treat humanity. Either as another person or oneself, as an end and never as a means. In other words, don't use people. What did George Berkeley mean when he said, to be is to be perceived? In Berkeley's view of what exists in the world, there are only three things, minds, ideas, and God. Angels are also minds, and another way of dividing up the world is into spirits and ideas. Human beings, angels, and God are spirits. Everything else is ideas. Nothing else is known to exist. But If only spirits and ideas exist, how can there be a world? Berkeley thought that what we think of as an external world is just one idea added to our ideas of sense. No idea of sense can exist without being perceived by some mind. Berkeley's motto was Esse est percipi, or, to be is to be perceived. 
The idea of an external world is an isolated idea in itself, but no more than an idea. Furthermore, many of the ideas that we think we have, which support the existence of external reality, are no more than special distinct ideas combined with ideas of sense. For example, the ideas reality and physical matter are just words to which nothing like an external world corresponds. At best, they are merely additional ideas. This doctrine that reality is just another idea, in Berkeley's sense, is what made him the philosophical idealist par excellence. Who was Voltaire? Voltaire was the pen name of François-Marie Arouet, 1694-1778. A playwright, poet, essayist, and widely read popularizer of Sir Isaac Newton. His philosophical letters, 1734, and Philosophical Dictionary, 1764. Both express his brilliant wit and underlying sense of social justice. He made great fun of Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, as Dr. Pangloss in the satire Candide, but although he thought that this was not the best of all possible worlds. As Pangloss did, he believed improvement was possible on specific issues. Voltaire's empiricism was similar to that of John Locke, 1632-1704. In that he was a moderate skeptic who also thought that human knowledge is generally adequate for the lives most people lead. In other words, we know what we need to know. He argued for toleration and objected to the narrowness of church Christianity. By the same token, he did not go as far as Jean-Jacques Rousseau. 1712-1778, in extolling simplicity over civilization. He replied to Rousseau after he gave him a copy of the social contract. I have received your new book against the human race, and thank you for it. Never was such a cleverness used in the design of making us all stupid. One longs, in reading your book, to walk on all fours. But as I have lost that habit for more than 60 years, I feel unhappily the impossibility of resuming it. What was Immanuel Kant's notion of synthetic a priori knowledge? Knowledge is synthetic or ampliative, according to Kant. If it is about objects that can be experienced in the world, it is a priori if it can be known without experience. What was meant by reason during the Enlightenment? Reason was considered a universal capacity of all people that was brought to fruition by logic and the knowledge of science. It required people to abandon superstition and oppressive institutions such as absolute monarchy and doctrinaire religion.
He was educated at Yale, preached and knew how did the Enlightenment affect the United States? America did not develop its own philosophical tradition. Until the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the period before the American Revolution and the founding of the New Republic. The excitement of liberty from oppressive government, the dignity of the individual. And rights to private property were all highly motivating ideas. These optimistic ideas were inspirational in the writings of Thomas Paine. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and others. The American separation of church from state, as an article of individual liberty against oppressive government religion. And for free thought and speech came directly from Enlightenment ideas. As did the division of the powers of government and the distrust of government. It should be noted, however, that libertinism and outright atheism were to remain European phenomena for a very long time. Under the inspiration of Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758, American Protestant religious philosophy flourished. In the late 18th century in a New England born-again movement known as the Great Awakening. York City, and became a leader of the Great Awakening in 1729 in Massachusetts. His theology was a Puritan form of Calvinism. Edward's interest in philosophy included Nicholas Malebranc. 1638-1715, the Cambridge Platonists, and John Locke, 1632-1704. He was himself an idealist, similar to George Berkeley, 1685-1783. Who held that human minds are made up of thoughts and sensations, God being the only true substance. Why is George Berkeley considered either an aberration or an obstacle? Berkeley is an aberration insofar as his ideas defy common sense to the point of being dismissible as simple absurdities. He is an obstacle insofar as he founded a powerful and enduring school of thought that dominated some areas of philosophy in the 19th century and evolved into very perplexing progressive movements in the 20th and, it now seems, 21st centuries. Why were ideas important to Berkeley? An idea in this sense is a technical term, meaning some discrete thing in the mind. Berkeley's metaphysics began with the assumption that all we ever know are our ideas, which are in our minds. This is one reason why ideas are so important. We tend to assume that if we have a word for something then we have an idea of it. But sometimes we fool ourselves, and our words are just empty with no ideas behind them. Therefore, we need to make sure that we actually have the ideas we think. We have just because we are accustomed to using language in certain ways does not mean that all words that are intelligible to us refer to ideas. 
if we reflect on abstract, general words, such as man, whiteness, animal, or matter, it becomes evident that there is nothing in the mind to which these words refer. All of our ideas are about particulars or combinations of particulars. We lack the capacity to create new ideas only God can do that although we are able to combine existing ideas in new ways and create copies of existing ideas. Was Immanuel Kant only interested in the foundations for knowledge of the physical world? No. In addition to what Kant held to be man's universal off or the starry heavens above. He addressed the moral law within as a subject of practical reason. He also had lasting things to say about the self and belief in God. How did George Berkeley's theory of vision relate to the concept of matter and physical existence? Berkeley is well known for his theory of vision that contributed so much to modern psychology of perception. However, in that theory he completely repudiated the primary bastion of empiricism, namely, matter. Berkeley departed from both common sense and science in elaborately insisting that matter the entire physical world based on our best evidence, simply did not exist in the way that the other empiricists Hobbes, Locke and Hume, and later on, John Stuart Mill and Bertrand Russell assumed that it did. For any serious student of the history of philosophy, Berkeley is either a delightful aberration or an intractable obstacle because of this position. To whom is Berkeley's idealism perplexing? To those who continue to cleave to the reality of the perceived existence of an external world. Berkeley's idealism can be perplexing. It is also a problematic position for many scientists. Who must believe in an objective reality in order for their work concerning objective facts to make sense. What was original in Jonathan Edwards' view of God? Jonathan Edwards developed the idea that God loves and is delighted by himself and creates us and other creatures as part of this joy in himself. Edwards taught that God's love is disinterested and that he is supremely beautiful. Infusing the entire world with his loveliness. By comparison, the beauty seen by mortals is secondary, an imperfect copy of what God sees. What were Voltaire's religious views? Voltaire rejected the wager of the brilliant 17th century mathematician Blaise Pascal, 1623 to 1662. The following passage from Pascal's Pensées constitutes the famous wager, God is, or he is not. 
but to which side shall we incline? Reason can decide. Nothing here. There is an infinite chaos which separated us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn. Up. Which will you choose then? Let us see. Since you must choose. Let us see which interests you least. You have two things to lose, the true and the good, and two things to stake, your reason and your will. Your knowledge and your happiness, and your nature has two things to shun, error and misery. Your reason is no more shocked in choosing one rather than the other. Since you must of necessity choose. But your happiness. Let us weigh the gain and the loss in. Wagering that God is. If you gain, you gain all, if you lose, you lose nothing. Wager, then, without hesitation that he is. In other words, if we don't know whether God exists, we have two choices. We can base our life on the premise that he is. In that case, if he exists, we will go to heaven. But suppose he doesn't exist? It's still better to bet that he is, because if he isn't, we lose nothing. Whereas, if we bet that he isn't and he isn't, we are merely confirmed in our misery, but if he turns out to exist, we go to hell when we die. Voltaire would have none of this. Voltaire believed that the design evident in nature was proof of God's existence, as first cause, prime mover, and supreme intelligence. How can a benevolent and omnipotent God permit evil to exist? Voltaire was very distressed by the Lisbon earthquake and tidal wave that struck on All Saints Day in 1755, killing thousands. In his poem Sir L.E. Disaster to Lisbon, 1755, he rejected both Leibnizian optimism and the doctrine of original sin. He concluded that all humans can do is accept such evil and continue to worship. In Tzadig and other writings his sense of religious awe was further stressed. He maintained an attitude of tolerance for the rest of his life, with ongoing interests in the teachings of Confucius and the Quakers. In his final years, Voltaire overtly attacked the Catholic Church for its intolerance. He proclaimed, those who can make you believe absurdities, can make you commit atrocities. Who was Jonathan Edwards? Jonathan Edwards, 1703-1758, was the third president of Princeton University. Although he died a year after he was elected. What are the two types of ideas according to George Berkeley? Ideas, according to Berkeley, can only exist in one or another mind that is capable of perceiving them. The two types of ideas known to human beings are ideas of sense, which come into the mind from somewhere outside it, and ideas of the imagination. God, however, who creates all ideas out of nothing, does not have ideas of sense because nothing can affect. 
him. God has only ideas of imagination. No idea is capable of doing anything on its own. Every idea is passive. Only minds can act or do anything. All ideas must exist in minds. Without minds, there are no ideas. What did Edward Gibbon contribute? Edward Gibbon, 1737 to 1794, wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which was published between 1776 and 1788. This tome is still read today. Gibbon argued that Rome fell because of invasions by barbarians and the corruption of Christianity that rendered the citizens of Rome servile and pusillanimous. Was Jonathan Edwards merciful toward sinners? Not in the least. Jonathan Edwards thought that many humans were depraved and that a real hell awaited them. There is a tone of delight in these facts in his 1741 sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards not only believed that sinners would be punished, but that God himself had no pity for their agony. He wrote, if you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case. Or showing you the least regard or favor, that instead of that, he will only tread you underfoot. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you. Yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy, he will crush out your blood and make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments, so as to stain all his raiment. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. And, insofar as the virtuous strive to emulate God, Edwards felt it is fitting that they enjoy the suffering of such sinners in hell. In 1758, in his Why Saints in Glory Will Rejoice to See the Torments of the Damned, Edwards wrote, When they shall see how miserable others of their fellow creatures are, who were naturally in the same circumstances with themselves. When they shall see the smoke of their torment and the raging of the flames of their burning, and hear their dolorous shrieks and cries. And consider that they in the meantime are in the most blissful state, and shall surely be in it to all eternity, how will they rejoice? What reforms did Cesar Beccaria advocate? Cesare Beccaria, 1738-1794, wrote on Crimes and Punishments, 1764, which was influential against the idea that punishment serves retribution. He reasoned that the purpose of imprisonment was the protection of society and the reform of criminals. Beccaria's book is believed to have been influential in the abolition of torture and maiming as routine criminal punishments by the mid-19th century.
is there a sharp distinction between Enlightenment philosophers and other intellectuals? No, both Enlightenment philosophers and other intellectuals influenced the ideas of the time. Among philosophers, those who have endured historically as part of the present. Philosophical canon are limited to George Berkeley, David Hume, Thomas Reed. Jeremy Bentham, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Immanuel Kant, and Guy Ambatis de Vico. John Locke is also strongly associated with the Enlightenment. Although he dates back to the 17th century. However, during their times, brilliant thought in other fields by writers and personalities such as Ethan Allen, Marquis de Condorcet, Denis Diderot, Jonathan Edwards, Benjamin Franklin, Baron D. Holbach, Thomas Jefferson, Joseph Marie de Maister, Charles Baron du Montesquieu, Thomas Paine, Joseph Priestley, Adam Smith, Mary Wollstonecraft, William Godwin, and Voltaire. Francois Marie Rouet were part of the intellectual climate for philosophers, as well. Who was George Berkeley? George Berkeley, 1685-1753, was the founder of modern idealism. Unlike his 17th century idealist predecessors, such as Nicholas Malebranche, 1638-1715, or Gottfried Leibniz, 1647-1716, he was not a rationalist. Berkeley was completely comfortable with science and empiricism in general. And he significantly weighs in with the great triumvirate of British empiricists. John Locke, 1632-1704, George Berkeley, 1685-1783, and David Hume, 1711-1776. Berkeley was born in County Kilkenny in Ireland, where he went to Kilkenny College for four years. Beginning at age 11. He then went to Trinity College in Dublin and was elected a fellow there in 1707, holding the position until 1724. His first book, An Essay Towards a New Theory of Vision was published in 1709, followed by the treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge in 1710. In 1713, he moved to London and published three dialogues between Hylas and Philonas, the first of his works to be well received. He was presented to Queen Anne by the renowned essayist and satirist Jonathan Swift. 1667 to 1745, and became friends with the literary elite of that time. In 1713, Berkeley traveled to Sicily as chaplain to the ambassador. His next position was as a tutor to St. George Ash, the Bishop of Derry, which involved further travel in Europe. He then wrote De Motu, On Motion, in 1721, as well as an essay towards preventing the ruin of Great Britain, in which he argued that a recent financial crisis, the South Sea Island bubble, which was a stock market crash that resulted from over-speculation, was the result of a decline in religion and morals. In 1723 he received a windfall inheritance from Esther van Humrij. 
an Irish woman of Dutch descent who was a longtime correspondent and lover of Jonathan Swift, who called her Vanessa in his poetry. Berkeley claimed that she was a perfect stranger. In 1724 Berkeley was appointed Dean of Derry, which provided him financial security. But his dream was to found a Christian college in Bermuda that would admit Negroes and Indians, as well as white Americans. He raised money for the project, but not enough for it to become a reality. The British Parliament awarded him £20,000, but that money never came through. Berkeley married in 1728 and he and his wife, Anne, went to Rhode Island to set up farms to grow food for the prospective college. They remained there for three years, and then returned to live in London. He defended Christianity in the Minute Philosopher in 1732, and claimed that mathematics was more mysterious than religion in the Analyst in 1734. That same year, he became Bishop of Cloyne, which led him to move back to Ireland, where he remained until he died in 1753, while visiting his son at Oxford University. <laughs>